Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to start in verse number 27, but uh, I just want to give you a little background. What Jesus had just dealt with is the, the man we call the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him, uh, what do I need to do, <clears throat> basically he said, to get into heaven? And so Jesus said, uh, obey the commandments. Now, what he, what he, the point he was making is not saying, he's not saying, if you obey the commandments, you'll go to heaven. He's telling that he's getting down to the point of the matter. He didn't, Jesus wasn't, the way I see is, is in his life, he wasn't one just to, to stand up and, and preach what you had to do and what you, what you needed. He, he asked a lot of questions. And so sometimes he would make statements just to get people to think because it's, it's up to the individual to decide and understand what God has done for them. And if, if, how much will you learn in school if they never, never made you practice? I like to use mathematics because that takes a lot of practice, right? And if, if they told you two plus two was four and they said it once, would you know it the next year if you never practiced it and used it in on paper? God made God Christ had people think through things and they would answer. Sometimes the answers were right, sometimes they were wrong. But when he talked to this rich young ruler, he said, Obey the commandments. Well, the rich young ruler says, Well, which ones? <laughs> what do you mean, which ones? Now, all of them. <laughs> but Jesus enumerated several commandments and he pointed out and when you look at it it's all about his relationship with man okay the last uh, six commandments uh, of the ten commandments he pointed out and the, and the rich young ruler says well I've done that ever since I was young I've done that all my life Jesus didn't say well then go back to the first commandment Thou shalt uh, have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All Everything in relationship to God, he didn't point that out. All he said to him was, go sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. And he, whoa, he was rich and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he walked away. And the point I see in that account is that that rich young ruler Yes, he, had a, he thought he had a great relationship with people. He did what was right between them, but he didn't do what was right between him and God. And so he had God, or he, his God was his belongings, and he didn't want to get rid of them. And so that's, that's the background. So J this man has just now walked away. Jesus has told the people, told the, his disciples, that uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man uh, to enter into heaven because that rich man had walked away. And they said, well, they understood that the camel can't go through the eye of a needle. So he says, he said, uh, the men said, well, that's impossible. And what did Jesus say? With men, it is impossible. You can't put a camel through the eye of a needle. And he said, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So that means that it is, a rich man can go to heaven if God works in his heart and the man accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior. So the people, the disciples ask him then, well, if that's the case, who can be saved? Uh, then Peter asks a question. And we're, that's where we're going to start in verse number 27, Matthew chapter 19. Jesus asked, uh, well, let's read what it says. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the re regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, 
Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last. They go on to chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven, and he tells a parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, <clears throat> he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the, his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they came, they that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. So Jesus tells this parable. He says, and we, we, we hear the parable, and we... we Again, it, it's like we, we mentioned this morning. We'll read a, a verse and we'll forget what the beginning of the verse was all about. And so we read this parable and we focus on the parable and what this uh, householder does and how he pays these people. But we forget what Jesus, what the point is made. Look back up to verse number one there of chapter 20. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto this man. So th this is a picture of of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the kingdom age. Jesus Christ is going to return uh, at the rapture, and he's going to draw us out. If we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are born again, and we are going to be uh, taken up with Jesus in a rapture. Or uh, if we die before he returns, we'll be raised from the dead and go to be with him. Then later, about seven years later, he will return to the earth and set up his kingdom. And this is what we call the kingdom age. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. And he points out that we as Christians are going to have jo um, jobs in the kingdom, depending on how we have used our lives, how we have obeyed him, how we uh, have done what he what he wants. And so when you look back at what he's talking about, the, the rich man, or the, not the rich man, but the, um, yes, the rich man going to heaven, and Peter saying, well, what about us? We have given up everything. Shouldn't we have a great position in the kingdom? That's what he's asking. And Jesus says, um, everybody who has given up or forsaken all of these things, and I want you to keep in mind, let's look at it here uh, fairly quickly. Verse number um, 29, he says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, 
or brethren or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my namesake shall receive a hundredfold. You're going to get a hundred times more. He's not saying if you've, if you've forsaken, like he says, uh, forsaken a mother or wife, you're not going to get a hundred mothers back. He's just saying you're going to get a lot more. God is going to reward you with more than what you have given up. And keep, that, keep in mind that word forsaken. When we look at that word forsaken, to, to us in our language, we would think it's, it's something we just got rid of that. And he's saying uh, forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers. So forsake them. Uh, and that and it sounds to us like we don't want to have anything more to do with them. But that's not what it's talking about. That's not the word of the, the Greek that is being used here. The word that is used here in the Greek is a word that just means it is not taking as important a place. I, mean, I want to take you to, to places where it's translated a little bit differently because uh, here that word is so, such a harsh word that we uh, are reading. Look over at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And verse number 11. Now this is the, the uh, temptation of Jesus when he was in the wilderness for those 40 days. It says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That word leaveth there uh, is the same word that we find forsaken. Now, when you think about the devil leaving Jesus here, did he ever come back? Did the devil ever come back to, to uh, tempt Jesus? Well, not that we, not, we don't see it, but he was around. He didn't just leave Jesus alone. He didn't want Jesus to do what Jesus was going to do. He didn't want Jesus to save people. So Satan tried to get him to stop whatever he was going to do. Satan never left Jesus totally alone. He never forsook him like we think of that word. He, he left him for a while. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter, well, chapter, look at verse 22 of the same chapter. Now, this is talk, talking about James and John, and they're with their father Zebedee. And when they started following Jesus, it says, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. The word left there is the same word. They forsook the ship and their father. Do you think they ever went back to see their father? Sure they did. They didn't forsake him and say, I don't want to have anything more to do with you. So what Jesus is pointing, well, one more verse, and then we'll, we'll go on. Look at Matthew chapter 18. This one, I think, uh, shows a little more of what, uh, what I'm pointing out. Verse number 12. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? If he left the ninety-nine, that if, if we translate that word the same as they translated it, uh, um, if we forsake our houses and fathers and lands, if we translate it as forsake, do you think a man who has a hundred sheep and one gets lost, he's going to forsake, in our way of thinking, forsake 99 of them and go get this one? Forget about these. No, he left them probably in safekeeping, but he turned away from them. It was important enough for him to go get that other sheep and bring it back into the fold. So he never really got rid of the others. So in our life, in our minds and hearts, if we are going to follow Christ, and that's what uh, Jesus is, is talking about here, if we are going to follow Christ, then we are going to see that following him takes precedence over everything else in our life. And that's what the rich young ruler was missing. He was more involved in his riches then he cared really about going to heaven. What must I do to go to heaven? Well, 
Give up everything. Stop making your things your God. Set those aside and follow me. Give it up and follow me. Go over to Galatians. God wants all people to be saved. And the Bible teaches that he does not choose one over another because of how good somebody is or the way they live. It's he sent Jesus Christ to die for all people. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse number 6. Paul says, but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be someone in conference added nothing to me. So the point I'm making here is where it says, God accepteth no man's person. It's not about how strong you are. It's not about how good looking you are. It's not about how rich you are. It's about what you do with Jesus Christ. It's about recognizing that God gave Jesus Christ to die for your sins. And you must accept that as your payment. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died and paid our death penalty. And that's for all people, not just some. God didn't say, okay, I'm going to choose these three people. Jesus is going to die for those three. And there's 45 people over here. And over in Algeria, there's a thousand. I mean, he's going to die for all them, but everybody else. No, he died for everybody. It's up to the individual to say, I accept that. I make it mine. It's a gift that God has offered, and it's just like a, a birthday gift. It's not really yours until you accept it. It's given and offered to you, but until we reach out and say, I accept it, God, it's never really ours. God is, is no respecter of persons. When a person puts himself, or the person first, Jesus said he's going to be the least in the kingdom. Um, we go back to Matthew chapter 19. Verse 30, he says, many shall that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Um, the point he's, he's pointing out is humility. Giving up of ourselves, recognizing that others are to be more important than we are. Now, we don't go around feeding other people, saying here, and not feeding ourselves. We do have things that we take care of, but if it comes down to me sitting in front of somebody who's starving to death and I'm eating, then my love for that person is to say, here, you eat this instead of me. I can, I can go away without it. But it's a, about seeing others more important than ourselves. That's what G God said about love. Love God and love our fellow man. Those two important uh, concepts or laws uh, are what everything else hangs on. In Matthew 19 and verse number 29 he's telling us that the things we give up on earth are not anything compared to what God has to give us that rich man that rich young ruler only thought of himself and what he could have out of this life here look at uh, Proverbs 22. The Bible tells us that wise men are prudent men. What's what's prudence? Well, let me let's read the verse and then we'll uh, we'll talk about prudence. Proverbs 22 and verse number three. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. 
A prudent man is a wise man, but a wise man may not always be prudent. But a pr prudence is looking ahead and seeing that my choices, my actions, uh, the, the, where I go, what I do, am I going to get harmed by that? Am I going to have trouble as I go? Uh, my mother-in-law used to talk about when she was a, a little girl. Uh, they had to, when they were walking to school, they would walk through a field that had, I think it's a bull, wasn't it? And uh, the bull, she, she wasn't really afraid of the bull. She was really little, but she would cry so that her brother would carry her. She would, she, she saw ahead, only she wasn't, she was being wise in the wrong way. Wise to say, I'm going to cry so brother will carry me. I just don't feel like walking. We need to look ahead. We need to see ahead and say, you know, this is something that God either wants me to do or God doesn't want me to do it. And make the choice based on our knowledge of God and his will, what he wants for us. So a wise man looks ahead. A prudent man looks ahead. Here it says he, he sees the danger and he hides himself. But the simple, the person who doesn't have wisdom, just goes on, goes on about his life. When we know and recognize that God has given us his word he has written it down for us to tell us what we should know about him and about life, about the things he uh, uh, approves of and the things he doesn't approve of. We need to take that and learn and have wisdom to know what he wants. When we recognize what he wants, we recognize what he has done for us. We then come to the point where I, I understand that he gave Jesus Christ and Jesus paid my penalty of sin. We accept him as our Savior. Go over to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Now, that's where we are, isn't it? That's what I was reading. I was going to go to John chapter 13. I didn't go far enough in my notes. Go to John chapter 13. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And in John chapter 13, he's saying it, he's saying the same thing in just a little bit different way. But he gives them an example of what, uh, in, t in teaching them. John chapter 13, look at verse number uh, 12. So after, this is the night he was betrayed, it says, after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Now let me point out, the, the washing of feet was a, um, a standard practice during this time because they didn't have asphalt on their streets, and they, and they didn't wear closed-toed shoes. They wore sandals, so their feet would get dirty. And when you go into somebody's house, uh, usually the people didn't want you to have dirty feet, and so they would have a bowl, and they would wash your feet when you go into the house. Or they would have a servant do it. And so here, Jesus got down, and around that table, he washed the disciples' feet. Okay? Now, we're talking about God in the flesh. We're talking about uh, the Messiah, and uh, they call him Lord. Look what he says. Uh, he says, um, he washed their feet. Verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, again, it's another thing we've got to be careful here, because some people take that to mean that we need to have we need to practice foot washing in the church. And that's not what Jesus is pointing out. That's not what he's saying. 
uh, he's saying, listen, you, you need to have that attitude. Don't, because you're a master, because you're a, a, a lord or an employer, don't think that you are higher than the other people. I remember being uh, working at uh, Maranatha Baptist Bible College, and uh, I, I became the, the superintendent of buildings. And uh, there were people under me, but I really had a hard time telling them to do some dirty jobs that I ended up doing because I just didn't like them having to do it. Now, it's not, I'm not trying to brag, but I just recognized, yeah, I could have said, you do this, you do that, and you do that. And instead, I did it because I didn't want, I, there are other jobs they had to do, that's fine. But Jesus here, did he have to wash their feet? No. But he says, I want to show you the attitude that you should have, the humility that you should have in life. And so he got down and he washed their feet. He says in verse 15, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, that means truly, I, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Not about washing feet, it's about humility. And Jesus, if you tried to, to consider him, how humble he was in comparison to all the other people in the world, he's the most humble. Absolutely. But he was our Lord, he is our Lord and Master. He was their Lord and Master. But he says, I'm going to do this for you. James and John. <laughs> Go over to uh, uh, let's see. Is it in is it in John? No, it's Matthew chapter twenty. So right after he tells the parable, it looks like after Jesus talks about the, the parable of the, the man who went out and got these workers. By the way, you know, you look at this uh you think when you read this account in verse chapter 20, today, and, and when we think about this, how many of us would work all day for a penny? No, I, I wouldn't, because a penny is not much. But this penny was a day's wage, a normal day's wage. And so the people who came on the 11th hour, or 12 hours that people worked from 6 to 6 or so, uh, on the 11th hour would have been like 5 o'clock. They came and worked for one hour, and they got a whole day's wage because the boss wanted wanted them to. the The word for penny is a is a, actually where where uh, the Spanish word for money comes from. It was the Greek word. It's a denarion, and so the Spanish word for money is dinero, right? But uh, so it's a, a, a regular wage. But we come to verse number 20, and it says that, that James and John and their mom come to Jesus. I, I, I see this and I think, didn't, didn't they even get the point that Jesus was making earlier? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Look what happens. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with, their son, with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able, and he's talking to the men now, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, they say unto him, we are able. Now let me point out, he's not talking about baptism by water. He's, he's already been baptized. And he's sa saying to them, are you able to experience the same experience I'm going to have? Do you think you're able to be, and we know what happened to Jesus, 
Are you going to be able to be persecuted like I'm going to be persecuted? Are you going to have the same trouble as I'm having and go through it? Look what they said. They said, we are able, and he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So God the Father is the one who's going to determine who is going to be Jesus' right-hand man in the kingdom. It wasn't even up to Jesus at that time. And they're looking at, I want a position of importance in the kingdom. He says it's not about that. You, you need to have a humble heart. If you have, if you are the least now, okay, you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom. But you've got to have the right humble heart today. You've got to be humble, seeking God's will. Last uh, week we looked at contentment. James and John seems like they are not content. They won't be if they're looking ahead at the kingdom. If they're not first and second or on the right hand and on the left hand, they're not going to be satisfied. We've got to keep in mind also as we as we look at life now and, and the things that come to us, thinking ahead of what God has for us. We've got to keep in mind, you know, even if I don't know what God has for me, I, I know it's better than here. It's better than now. It's also so good that I can't even imagine. I don't have anything to worry about. God is going to give me exactly what I need. Exactly what is going to be good for me. I have... Phew, I lost it. Um, go over to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, and look at verse number 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. Now he's, he's at a feast or a banquet. When he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, by the way, the chief rooms is chief positions on, at the table. I don't know if you remember the, the account of Joseph, uh, when Joseph uh, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt from Canaan, and when when the servants sat them at their table, he sat them in order of their importance, according to their ages. And they thought, wow, that's weird. That's strange that they did that. That's the normal way they would sit at a table. So Jesus is looking at the people and how they choose their places at the table. <clears throat> and he saw that some thought they were important and they sat at the highest position. He says, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Fred, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So consider yourself the least of anybody. And if, if it's time, they'll be lifting you up. The Bible tells us, Peter and, and uh, James, Humble yourselves. Well, let's look, look at it. Go to First Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. First Peter 5, verse number 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. It's not, a, it's not for us. 
to exalt ourselves. It's not for us to lift ourselves up as being better or uh, more important than somebody else. It's up to God to do that. It's up to us to say, you know, I'm nobody. I'll do what, what God wants me to do now because one day he will lift me up. Not that I'm going to be lifted up above other people so people can look at me. It's about my relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about being humble so he lifts me up. As I said earlier, we don't even understand uh, the, the goodness that we will receive if we humble ourselves, if we give up the things of this world and say, Lord, I want to be with you. I'm going to do what you want. Do your will and stay close to you. And everything in the, the world takes second place. Okay. Look at the first Corinthians chapter two. When he says you'll get a hundredfold. He's not saying literally. He's not talking about material even. He's talking about what the blessings are that you will receive are going to be so great that you won't know how to receive it. First Corinthians chapter two, look at verse number nine. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, what what can you see that God has that he's going to bless you with? I have no idea, but I know my God. I know my God, and he's a good God. He's not going to give me something that I'll be dissatisfied with. You know, and that's why I, I've heard people preach, men say, uh, in heaven, and this is what they, they talk about, in heaven, you'll see the great big mansion, and you can see the, the small house over here, and all of these things. You say, well, who lives in that big mansion? Must have been a great preacher for the Lord. And, he's, and they'll say, well, it turns out it's the, the old lady who couldn't even get out of her house, but she was a prayer warrior. So she's in the great, big, beautiful mansion. And over here is a, um, just a regular old house, and that's where the preacher lives. Not just a preacher, but a great preacher, evangelist or something. You know, heaven's not like that. I don't see heaven as like that. In the kingdom, there's going to be levels of, of uh, uh, position. And that's what James and John were looking at, being the right hand or on the left hand. But heaven is, everybody's going to be the same. When, after, the, after the kingdom age and, and we go to be with Christ in heaven, there is no difference between people. Even Jesus said uh, in the resurrection, uh, people are going to be like the angels, neither marrying or giving in marriage. There's, there's, they have a, we have a job to do. We have uh, something else that God has for us that we can't even see. We don't understand it, but we look forward to it. Because God is good. We need to keep doing right. Keep on serving God. Because God will not forget what we've done for him. Go over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 10. The writer says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. It says, you, he, he, he's not going to forget what you've done. He's going to remember that. Go on, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So God is going to reward us. Being humble in this life is going to bring more blessings later on. Not necessarily in this life, 
But the rewards that God has for us are so great, we can't even imagine what it's going to be like that God gives to us. But until then, we are God's servants. We are to be his humble servants. And if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are his children. He is our father. And remember that he's going to give us much more than we deserve. What do we deserve? Hell. We deserve hell, but God made the way that we don't have to. I read, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you the example, but I did read an example of, of what, uh, 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 of what God has done for us. And I thought it was beautiful. I'm going to share it with, share it with you at some point, but not tonight. Uh, God said, here's what needs to be done because you're a sinner. You, you need to pay for that sin. But the way you pay for that sin, you'll never get it paid for. It's just not going to happen. So instead, I'm going to pay for it myself. And so God says, here's my son, Jesus Christ. And he's going to die in your place. He's going to take the penalty. When he takes the penalty, that's great, but you need to accept it. If you don't accept it, it doesn't do you any good. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ, recognizing that God gave him for us. We are nothing. God, we are, I mentioned that in the song about we are that temple of clay. We are but dust. But God in his love says, I want you to be with me. And so being nothing, that is a great privilege to know that God wants us to be with him. But that's the only way we can go is through Jesus Christ. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, help us to see that our our minds and hearts should be those of humble servants, servants of you and servants of others, to give of ourselves out of love, out of obedience to you. Lord, help us not to try to get everything we can out of this life, because this life is going to end, and this life, the things of this world are going to burn up. But Lord, help us to have a focus on the future, everlasting life that you've promised to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us and directing us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.